about some things that the Lord has been revealing to me over the past few months, but this was somewhat triggered by something that happened during the week. You know, I find it really fascinating how it is that we get a word from the Lord. Uh, you know, it comes when you least expect it. But one thing that I experienced this week was that sometimes there's something in the atmosphere that makes your spirit become aware that something is about to be revealed. Then you kind of build up this little anxiety. Okay, here it comes, here it comes. Uh, it's, it's kind of what happened to me. Um, so a few days ago, my mother sent me a message. Uh, and it was about a picture of my father-in-law that she saw on the internet. So I responded to her uh, based on, on her message, what I thought it was going to be the description of how he looked. Uh, you know, and before she responded back, I already knew that I was going to get something from God. So my father-in-law, he was diagnosed with dementia a while back. And the way that he's deteriorating is the same way that my grandfather deteriorated prior to his death because he had the exact same thing. So I've had conversations with my mother-in-law and, and you know, sometimes we, we speak about God and his words and, and what he declares uh, for our lives. But one thing that I have noticed is that she has this attitude like some people that I've seen that it's, it's uh, kind of like a defeatist attitude. Um, so as I was thinking about these things, I started to think about the will of God. And I know that before I have spoken here about this, but now I want to look at things from a different perspective, from the perspective of having a defeatist attitude. So we all know the things that the Lord has promised us, but there's people that take some of those promises that God has made us and they diminish them by adding something to it. So I wanna show you what I mean by this. And I don't wanna sound uh, facetious, but this is kinda of how I'm reading this. So let me give you an example. Deuteronomy 28, 11 says, and the Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your livestock and in the fruit of your ground within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. And then I put in parentheses, if he feels like it. That's kind of what I mean by people having a defeating attitude, defeatist attitude. Uh, I, I have come to see that people will say, well, yeah, the Lord said this, the Lord said that, but it's gonna happen if he wants to. If he didn't want to, yeah. Shouldn't that be in the Bible like that? Mm. Let me give you another example. Jeremiah 33, verses 1 uh, to 3. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the guard. Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have known, you have not known. If I want to. Verse 6. Behold, I will bring to it health and healing, and I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. <coughs> Again, if I want to. Based on this, I, I think sometimes we don't see more manifestations of the things that God has promised us. Because sometimes we diminish what he can do when we cannot seem to accept what we've been told. So what is it that we have been told? Where? That, well, that we are the righteousness of God, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 1. That we have been called to his own glory and excellence, by which we have been granted his precious and very pro great promises, so that through them we will become partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. What else have we been told? Well, that we have been given authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt us. Luke 10, verse 19, you know? Also, the Bible calls for us to intercede. 
And this is what it says in James 5, verses 13 through 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I don't believe that what is being said in here is that you're going to get healed if someone prays for you. Because that is putting the focus on the person. What I think is being said in here is that when you agree with the prayer of the person that prays over you, that you know that his prayer has been heard by God and that his prayer is in agreement with what your need is, that is the prayer of faith and the focus is in him. Amen. So right now, my mother-in-law is worried that her husband might not go to heaven because he didn't know the Lord and because of his current state, his diminished mental capacity, he doesn't have the ability to reconcile with God. Well, I don't agree with that. I think that our spirits are like water. You try to grab water, you can't do it. You need some sort of container like a glass. And that's the only way that you can have some water that you can have in one place, holding it. Well, that's what our bodies are. Our bodies are the vessel for our spirit for it to dwell on this earth. But that's it. To me, God is already dealing with his spirit. He just cannot manifest in his physical in this physical world because of the limitations right now of his current state of his body. But we have the spirit of God dwelling inside of us. And it's the spirit that gives us the words that we need to say, our declaration of faith that sets things in motion for the promises of God to come to pass in our lives. I know that the moment that my wife, her siblings, and her mother all stand together in agreement and declare, Father, we believe that you have declared us righteous and that we are healed by the stripes of Jesus. And right now we confess that Leo, that's his name, is healed and no longer has any afflictions in Jesus' name. At that very moment, even before they're done speaking, he's going to get up and say, praise God, for I am healed. Because yes. that's how powerful God is. Yes. Amen. So, Amen. That's, that's my little nugget of wisdom for today. Anyone has any uh, praise the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> any prayer requests or testimony? Yes, Sam. Uh, I love Jesus because I have confessed it with my siblings, so I just felt like I'm all just add on. <laughs> like I already said, um, Friday night.
by the word that he has sealed, no man can undo the words that he has spoken and Amen. sealed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Be bold, be courageous, and Amen. speak the word of God, your sword of the spirit. Yes. seeing in a, a prayer Friday night the situation of uh, the darkness and the light has been pretty much prevalent for the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's been ramping up really hard. <clears throat> and I know it's always darkest before the dawn. Uh, but the situation I was seeing Friday night was uh, pastors in our midst as a Mordecai speaking to Esther as a church. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the church acts like uh, Vashti who has her own agenda, has her own ways, has her own uh, life, and doesn't want to be in the presence of uh, Mordecai. And, and I see it as the Lord wanting to, uh, the Lord as also Mordecai, Esther's uncle. And, uh, <clears throat> but the Lord is the bridegroom, Esther the bride, the church, and I see Vashti as the the wife of the bride of Christ who's just trying trying to do things on her own without being in the presence of her husband. <clears throat> but the situation is rising up where all are called to be the Lord. The Lord is also calling out the Vashti, come into the, in my presence, come into my presence, come into my presence. And for 20 minutes, I struggled because I couldn't remember the name Esther. Because I kept hearing Hadassah, which was her real name. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm praying for Hadassah, her ears, to be the same as on Esther, as on Vashti, that the whole body of Christ would hear the voice of the bridegroom. Okay, <clears throat> in the midst of things going on, there's been several uh, people passing away. My uncle, uh, by the time I heard about it Sunday night, he was gone by Monday morning. Heard about that situation, uh, Cindy. I rushed her to ER on Monday night because she couldn't breathe anymore; her breath was gone. And the battle's been raging all week with this situation. They can't name exactly what's going on because it's an unseen thing. Okay, she's here right now, and I praise God for that. But we got to get to the root of what's going on. We know what the root is, and we know who's causing this havoc. So I pray that. We have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Lord's specifically speaking to us about strategy, about taking back what is ours, what is rightfully ours, our heritage, our, our heritage, and the things that he is bringing forth in our midst. Because this body has been called for a specific reason. We've been called from the north and the south and the east and the west for such a time as this. And there are more coming that are being called right now that haven't responded yet. But I pray that for pastor, that he is able to stay strong, and that those in leadership here are able to stay strong, and that as we place our feet on the rock, that no wind or thunder will knock us off and keep us strong. In the name of Jesus.
people in my life that care enough and to call on them in many ways. Yes. Because again, you know, a lot of this stuff is elementary, but <laughs> that's the beautiful thing about it is, is that it's elementary enough that even I can understand it to, to the degree that I do. God's grace is children are coming to you because you are calling us. We are being called and the enemy does not agree with that. So we are being attacked with things of this world that we know for a fact are not true. Things that are showing us contradiction to what your word says, Father. But we believe in your word, the word that you have given us that is true. Breath of the Comforter, come, come. are more than conquerors. We are God's children. And he has called us. So good. All right. Announcements. Uh, the sign of sheet for the children's ministry. Ministry. Sorry. It's in the back. Um.
I believe. We're asking some volunteers to sign out in two week blocks. Is that correct? Okay. So, and today we welcome Gideons International. All right. So let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease germ and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of the servant. And Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, Mark and John, will you take the offering? This uh, first offering is for a regular church, tithes and offerings. Uh, we'll have a second offering, especially for Gideons after. Uh, John, can you say the blessing, please? worship center his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts shouting with a voice of praise hallelujah 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 y'all ready to worship hallelujah Oh, 
back any further Throw off your fear And make a change Get right with God In Jesus' holy name I call the East Come! I call the West Come! I call to every tribe and tongue Hallelujah! I call the North Come! I call the South Call them out, call them out, 
call them out in Jesus' name. Call them out in Jesus' name. The enemy causes these distractions for one reason, and that's to keep our eyes off the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know what our weapon is, our strongest weapon? That's to turn around and worship him, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We look to you, Lord. We look to you, Lord. We look to you, Lord. Where our help comes from.
representative from the Gideons comes forth. Psalm 122, verse 1 says, I was glad when they said I could come into the house of the Lord. Amen. And this morning I've heard people talk about how we come together as the body of Christ to lift one another up. And we praise God for that opportunity as we come together because when we leave here, we not only go out into the mission field, but we also go out into the world. But greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So I just lift that up to you. But at the same time, I want to share with you about the Gideon Ministry. It is a ministry that started 115 years ago, and we started with just three Gideons, and we now have 300,000 men and women who volunteer their time to help distribute God's word around the world. But I also want to share with you, you have a rack in your church which has different cards, but I want to share one with you that you haven't seen, or maybe you have, but it's this one here. And this card here, our camp sent one to several of the pastors, including your pastor, which says, Pastor, for the time you give, the work you do, and the care you offer. And then on the inside, it says, in honor of Pastor Nathan, one Bible was donated by the Des Moines East Camp Gideons. And then on the other side of the card, it says, God bless you for your service and dedication now and always. And then at the bottom, it says, remember without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love. And I mention this card because not only did we send it to him, but I've had the opportunity to speak in a lot of different churches. And I know that we don't always hear the word preached. But I know in your church, you get a chance to hear God's word, and it's preached from the Bible. And I wish we had more of that in a lot of the churches. But there's other cards like this one, thinking of you, where you can send a card to someone uh, to let them know you're thinking about them. And then there's this card here, which is an in recognition, a birthday, an anniversary, Maybe it's, uh, they got a promotion, maybe they're retired. And then this one here, which of course is in memory of someone who's passed away. And each of these cards uh, we furnish to, the, to you uh, free of charge. And then on the inside, there is a little envelope like this. So you send the card to the individual and you send the check for the Bible or Bibles that you wanna send to uh, the Gideons. And I mention all of this because when you uh, give a Bible, or $5, which buys one of these Bibles, I know that you support missionaries. How would you like to have a missionary who works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for six and a half years for $5? Well, you know, this Bible is placed in a hotel somewhere around the world and it has that opportunity to be there for six and a half years, some cases longer, and even when we replace that Bible, it is still used, it's sent to some of the shelters, or sometimes it goes right into the prison. Matter of fact, our camp, Des Moines East Camp, is responsible for the uh, Polk County Jail, and last year we gave 4,000 Bibles to those men that were in the prison there. And so you say, you know, what does one Bible make a difference? Well, you know, if you look at the scriptures, it talks about how Jesus called out and said, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And they said, but we feast all night and caught nothing. He said, throw your nets out. And they did. And what happened? They brought in so many that the nets started to break. And then there's also the story where Jesus fed 5,000 men and women with two fish and five loaves of bread. 
So it could have been as many as 15,000 people there that day, and yet they took up 12 baskets that were left over. Well, I share that with you because what does one Bible make a difference? I started out sharing about this card here. What I didn't share with you was what was on the back. Because if you had a chance to read the bottom on the back, it's from somebody who is a, uh, actually it's from Raul Tanik. Tanika, I'm not going to get that name right. He's from the Philippines, and he wrote, My grandfather received a testament while growing up in the Philippines. He read it every day and was saved. He became a pastor and prayed that his sons would become pastors too. God answered his prayer. All five of his sons became pastors, and so did their 15 sons, including me. God has used this family to start over 500 churches. One Bible started 500 churches. And Isaiah 55, verse 11 says, So shall my word go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the things for which I sent it. We stand upon that promise that when we give out those testaments, they will not return void. Hallelujah. And we give out a lot of them. Yeah. It took 22 years to give out the first million, and we now do it every five days. Wow, that's awesome. So this year, we're, our goal is 87 million. And there is something special about this year because our year actually starts June 1st and ends May 31st. Somewhere, someplace, sometime during this year, a Gideon or an auxiliary member is going to give out the two billionth Bible. <laughs> so that shows how God has blessed this ministry. We believe in Acts 1.8, which says, When power comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but to the uttermost parts of the earth. We have Gideon camps in 197 countries, and we have the Bible in 99 languages. We have one goal, one vision, to win men and women and boys and girls to Jesus Christ. We do that by personal witnessing and by distributing God's word. Some, it was mentioned, some plant, some water, but it's the Holy Spirit that brings forth the increase. That's what the ministry is all about. And when you give to this ministry, 100% goes for Bibles. There's not too many organizations, and we talked about that a little while ago. If you have a telemarketer call you, just ask them, how much of what I give goes to what you're asking me to give to? And sadly to say, most of it goes to the telemarketer. But with the Gideons, 100% goes for Bibles. And that's been that way since I joined 28 years ago, and it's still that way today. One of the things about the Gideons is we always get a chance to hear testimonies, and I like this testimony, and some of you can relate to it if you're old enough, and that's because of Tim Spencer. Tim Spencer uh, actually grew up in Missouri at an early age. Their family moved to Oklahoma, and the dad uh, had a job and several of his brothers in the lead mine. Well, Tim, he didn't want to end up with his life in the lead mines, so he knew how to play a little guitar, and he knew how to rhyme a few words, and so he got a job in the Bucket of Blood, quite a name for a tavern. And he was there for a couple of years, but he decided he would go off to California for his fame and fortune. Isn't that the way all of us look for? His fame and fortune out in the world. And we have it right here in God's word. But he went, to, went there, and he found two other guys, Bob Nolan and Leonard Sly, and they started up the group, uh, the Pioneer Trio. Well, you know, Leonard Sly was not a very good name for Hollywood, so they changed his name to Roy Rogers. Well, in the 1940s and 50s, they would travel a lot, and they were doing movies and making records, and in 1949, Tim Spencer wrote a song, Cigarettes, Whiskey, and Wild Wild Women. You see, Tim was married, but while he was on tour, he got involved in some of those things that he wrote about. Well, his wife, when he came home, would say, let's go to church. And he would say, oh, I'm too tired. i got to go back out on the road again. And so Tim uh, stayed home, didn't go to church. 
So she went to her pastor and said, Pastor, what can I do? And he said, well, send a letter to him, but you'll have to send it to him to the hotel that he's going to be checking into, and in that letter put some Bible verses. So she thought that was a good idea. You see, back then they didn't have Facebook and Twitter and email, emails <laughs> and computers. And so she sent the letter ahead. Well, when he went to check into the hotel, sure enough, there was a letter from his wife. And so he took it up to his room and he got it out and he started to read it. In that letter, it had some verses from the Bible. And what was on the nightstand but a Gideon Bible. So he got it out, and he wanted to check to see if those verses were correct. And sure enough, they were. But then he kept reading the scriptures, and life God changed his life, and he gave his life to Jesus. Lord. Well, you know, when we give our lives to Jesus, we have to put off the old self and put on the new. So he decided that he knew a little bit about music, and so he started Man of Music. Well, in 1955... He published a song, which is called How Great Thou Art, one of the best-known Christian songs that's around. So you see how God took someone who published cigarettes, whiskey, and wild, wild women and really changed his life to how great thou art. God can change us because with God, all things are possible. And we believe that when we distribute God's word. As a matter of fact, I brought a couple of these. Actually, we have four different styles in the green, and what we do is we give these out in the universities and the colleges, and actually this year, uh, in September, which is one of our busiest months, we gave out 5,200 at the University of Iowa, 3,500 at the UNI, we gave out 6,700 at Iowa State. We also went to Drake University and, and Simpson and Co. I want to share that uh, you may not have noticed, but if you had happened to drive by Drake University, you would have saw 16 men out there giving these testaments out. That wouldn't mean much, except it rained all day that day. But they feel it's so important that we give out God's word that we were standing in the rain. We went down to Simpson. There was seven of us. We gave out 508 of these at Simpson. It rained from 7 to 8.30. We were there till 10, and then it cleared up. But we were out in the rain because we know how important it is for these young people today. They face a lot of challenges, and so we have the word of God. Blessed is he who brings the good news. We are blessed when we have that opportunity to give out God's word. And so it makes a difference, and we know that. I like to share the testimony just because of the name Sharmela Panella. Quite a name. She was born in India, and at the age of a year old, she moved to the United States with her family, and they were Buddhists. She grew up Buddhist, but when she went off to college, a lot of the kids there would ask her questions about Buddhism, and she couldn't always answer them. Well, normally when she walked through the campus, she would try to be on her cell phone or look down at the ground so that she didn't have to take anything or talk to anybody. But on this occasion, the Gideons were there giving out little green testaments. The Gideon caught her eye and said, here, here's a free copy of God's word. Well, she took that little testament, went back to her dorm, and she read the first four books of the Bible. And guess what? She learned about Jesus. Well, she kept reading that Bible, and three months later, she gave her life to Christ. There's quite a commitment in some cultures when you give your life to Christ. You see, she went home, she told her mother that she became a Christian. Her mother said, you will, be, you will come back less than a human. They believe in reincarnation, that you'll come back and you make your life better. Instead, her mother said, your life is going to be worse. But her sister is now a Christian. A year later, her sister got saved. So I'm sure between the two of them, they're working on the mother now, trying to get the mother, who is a devout Buddhist, to accept Christ. That's what we believe in. That's why we know that God's word does not return void. And that's what the ministry is all about. We distribute Bibles, like I say, around the world. It gives us an opportunity to reach millions of people. And, you know, there are 
When I said we're going to give out the two billionth Bible, there's getting close to seven billion in people in the world. So our work is not done. We still have to reach five more billion people. And God's word will not return void. But I want to give you, uh, thank you, for, and especially your pastor, for giving me this opportunity to share with you about what's going on in the Gideon ministry. And God will change lives. Amen. Amen. Amen.
there's a vacuum out there in this world, in this land, searching for the truth. And if we don't get the truth out there, it's going to be filled with things that are not of the Lord. How would you feel if you walked into one of these hotels and saw a Quran sitting on the end table? If we don't make a stand now, if we stand and do nothing, the enemy will come in and fill that void. There's nothing like the Lord. And the world needs to know that there is a Savior who loves him. So Lord, I pray that you anoint this offering, Lord, my brothers, Mr. Hayes Cox and Gene Miller and those that I know are of this group, the Gideons, Lord, trusted men of God. Touch them, Lord. Touch them all, Lord Jesus. And give them a supernatural encounter, Lord, as they are handing out these, these Bibles, Lord, your word, that the Holy Ghost would come upon, Lord, and fire up revivals on the campuses and places they go to, Lord. And Lord, your word does not weaken. No. And as your word goes into the prisons after the six and a half year time, Lord, your word will not come back void because it never goes old. Revivals in the prisons because your word is there. Let the anointing of your word become three dimensional in all their midst, Lord. From the beginning of time, Lord, when it's passed out on the campuses, when it is laid in the, the hotels and the motels. Let that just be a beginning, Lord. Let it just be like the parting of the waters, Lord, when Moses was going through that sea. That those that are captive go into the freedom that you have caused to come forth by your word. Because your word will never be weak. Your word will always be strong. Let the offering that has been given today, Lord, be supernaturally multiplied, Lord. That we will hear revivals, Lord, coming from this, the two mites, Lord, like the widow gave. Bring it forth.
Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. A little louder. Praise the Lord. Praise Glory to God. Let's give him a great hand clap. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated in the worship team. Thank you again so much. Hallelujah. I don't know what non believers do when a 
small group can get together like this and feel the presence of the Lord just because we reach out to him, you know, hallelujah. Nothing, nothing greater in this life than knowing the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. I thank you again, uh, Bruce, for coming and sharing with us and giving us the opportunity to, uh, to sow into the kingdom of God on a large scale, in a larger way than we would be able to otherwise. It's our privilege to have you here with us today, and we just pray that the Lord will bless you and all the men and women that are involved in the Gideons, and, and uh, just let his anointing be on you mightily as you continue the work of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Sunday school kids can be dismissed. And I want to, uh, this morning, just kind of, as they say, piggyback here on uh, what Mr. Tillerson has already shared with us a little bit. Because I think sometimes we forget that uh, so much of what uh, the scriptures uh, tell us we have a tendency to be self-centered and kind of self-absorbed sometimes and forget that all that God does for us, he makes, he blesses us that we can be a blessing. And that's true of everything, including and most importantly, his word. It's one thing to know what the scripture says and to claim that and embrace it for yourself. We need to do that, obviously but it's a whole other thing when you share that truth and that reality with others who otherwise have no hope. In fact, the scripture talks about a people who were without hope, without God, desolate. And that's the description of the vast majority of this world. Yeah, there are millions of Christians, and thank God for that, but there are multitudes of people who have, believe it or not, I know it's hard to digest this as a Christian, who have never heard the name of Jesus, never seen a scripture. Praise the Lord. And Jesus most assuredly died for them as much as he did for us. Praise the Lord. So the thing about God is that he, uh, he's not exclusive. He's inclusive. He wants everybody to reap the benefits of the price that he paid. Yes. Amen? Amen? The cost was too great for anybody to not be given the opportunity to share the benefits yes. and the inheritance of what God has made available to us. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> before I get uh, to quote in scripture or posting it up here for you all to, to look at, in Hebrews 4, you know, I think a lot of times we think, and, and we've talked about this, what is faith? Oh, my God, I don't think I have enough faith. And, you know, I just got to really pray more and do this and do more of that to get more faith. Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that would be Jesus as well as this written word. It's the faith of Jesus and our belief in that. I've I, I tried to make it simple that, we put so much emphasis on our faith. This is about his faith. Jesus believed enough to do what he did. He had faith. And it's by the faith of Christ that we are saved. Yes. Now, we have to believe that. Right. But here, here, here's what I'm trying to say. Believing is actually easier than faithing. Yes. Faithing, we blow it up into something that's so abstract and, and uh, ethereal that we can't quite get our heads around it. But believing, Jesus said, you don't have a problem. The problem is not with your faith, he told his disciples. If you've got faith as a grain of a mustard seed, it's, it's plenty. Your problem is unbelief. So if you could believe this word, every single word that's in there, if you could believe that, nothing will be impossible to you. Right? Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, here's the problem. I've got a a granddaughter who's dating a young man, a great guy, but he claims to be an atheist. I, my take on it is he's just not too bright. <laughs> great guy, uh, but I just think atheism is just a stupid thing. It just doesn't make sense. It's a, you know, it's a fool who says there is no God. 
So uh, he, he's just misinformed. And I, I, what I'm saying is this. The, people have always been this way. The, in Hebrews 4, it talks about the, the Jews who never entered into the promises of God, into the promised land. He said, it's all finished for you. I've got houses there that you, that you didn't build. There's vineyards that you didn't plant. All of this that I want to give to you is there. But they didn't enter in because of unbelief. Right. Now, this thing is full of promises That's right. that God will never leave you or forsake you, no matter what the, the quote-unquote hell may be that you feel like you're going through at the moment. God is right there with you. Mm-hmm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. All, and if you pick a promise, and it's here, but it has to be believed for it to be a reality. That begins with believing in Christ and then everything that Christ has made available through his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, many Christians are struggling with the same issues that the Jews struggled with. We're not entering into the fullness of this relationship with God because of unbelief. Now, I just got a few statistics here just to throw out here at you because I think anybody that reads this would have to say, this is the most incredible book that has ever been written or could ever be written. Because though it was written by men's hands, the author was God himself. The Holy Spirit moved on people to write what they wrote. Now, some people will say, well, I mean, I don't know. How do you know that? That's just, you know, anybody. That's 2,000 years old, 6,000 years old. Surely it would have been distorted and perverted over time, you know, through the the way it's translated. And I don't, so so people say, well, I, I don't. I just don't believe that Jesus exists. If he did, he was just a guy. He was just some guy doing good. Well, let me just share a few things with you here. Just out of one book, I'm just, this is just about the book of Luke. Now, Luke says, I've investigated this whole thing. And uh, through all my research, I went to eyewitnesses. So it's not just about what hearsay. I, I went and spoke to hundreds, if not thousands of people who were eyewitnesses to the things that Jesus did and the words that he spoke. And then he wrote it down and he said, I took those words to them and said, now is this, did you really see him take two fish and five loaves and feed thousands of people? Yes. I was there. I saw it. I ate it. I saw the leftovers. Well, did you really see him pull in the nets and the nearly sunk the boat and the nets. Yeah, I was there. It was incredible. Never seen anything like it before. Multitudes of witnesses. Saw him walk on the water. I saw him walk on the water. I couldn't believe it, but it was him. I I saw it. I heard the words that he spoke. I saw the miracles that took place at his hand. And we say, well, I I can't get, I, I, I just... I don't believe it. Well, let me just give you some statistics here because you know what Mark Twain says. There are lies, damn lies, and then statistics, praise the Lord. So, but these are valid. These are valid. But how many of y'all heard of Julius Caesar? Y'all believe in Julius Caesar? Did you know that there are only 10 manuscripts in the world that talk about Julius Caesar? I mean, valid manuscripts that have been validated as true and real. Only 10. And those 10 were written, the earliest written manuscript about Julius Caesar that validates his reality was written over a thousand years after his death. And yet we don't have any problem believing in Julius Caesar. How how many of you believe in Plato? Y'all ever read anything about Plato, philosopher? Y'all have heard him. If you went to school, you had to hear about him. You believe in Plato? There's only seven manuscripts, valid manuscripts, that contain anything about Plato in the world. And of those seven manuscripts, the most recent was written 1,200 years after his death. How about Aristotle? 
You don't believe in Aristotle? Not Onassis. <laughs> so the one before him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's only five manuscripts in the world that are validated that speak about Aristotle. And of those five, the most current or recent one to his life was written 1,400 years after he died. Mm. Now, let me tell you about Luke. Did you know they have found over 5,000, in fact, over 5,500, I think it's 5,700 manuscripts of the book of Luke? They're there now. They're here in this world right now. And the earliest one was written 35 years after Christ. Mm. Do you know there have been college professors, archaeologists, that denied... <clears throat> the book of Luke, because he speaks of Pontius Pilate, and nobody ever found anything to identify a man called Pontius Pilate until 1961. <laughs> and they were digging around in a place called Caesarea, mm -hmm. and they found a stone that said that city had celebrated and dedicated the city to a governor by the name of Pontius Pilate. Other archaeologists argued there was no Caiaphas, no high priest named Caiaphas, because we've never found any record of it. In 1990, in a little place south of Jerusalem, they found a stone identifying the high priest as Caiaphas. It is. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. We have more historical empirical evidence of Jesus Christ than we have of most of the people we find in our history books. And yet the arrogant, so-called sophisticated intelligentsia of this world mock anyone who believes in a greater truth than they have. So I'm telling you, what I'm saying in that simple little monologue is this. Jesus Christ is real. Yes, he is. And his word is all the evidence you need. Mm -hmm. You may never get, I, I know most of you all have feelings and you felt the presence of the Lord and you heard the Lord speak to you in an inner voice from out of your spirit. But if you never had a feeling, if you never got a goosebump, if you never heard an audible voice, if you don't ever see a vision or have a dream, Jesus Christ is real and he's alive today. And there's more evidence of that than there is for anything else on this planet. And it's true. Because God said so. Praise the Lord. Now, with that in mind, we ought to believe. If he's real, then what he said is real. If what Luke wrote, what Mark, Matthew, John... Paul, Peter, James, John, if what they wrote is about a real person, they, they, they saw him face to face. Now, maybe the gospel writers didn't necessarily have personal contact with him, but they had firsthand knowledge of people that were eyewitnesses, that were with him. But then you come to Paul, who had his spiritual uh, awakening, but all these other writers of the epistles, they were... Disciples, they, they walked with him, they talked with him, they ate with him, they prayed with him, they, they lived with him. And they gave their lives as martyrs because of what he said and who he was. Now, look, we might be some bold preaching sometimes, but I'll tell you what, when somebody puts a gun to your head or a sword to your neck, if you don't really believe this, you're going to be looking for every way out possible. You're not going to just die for the sake of dying, just to promote your ministry, so to speak. Mm -hmm. 
they gave their lives because they knew this was true. And they had no fear of death. Right. Amen? Amen? If it's true for them, it's true for you. Right. Amen? Amen? And I don't care how many years. If the Lord tarries another thousand years, I can't imagine it going. <laughs> I'd be surprised if it goes ten. But I'm not setting dates. I'm just saying no matter how long the Lord tarries, uh -huh. it'll still be the truth. His word is forever settled in heaven. It's a question of whether we settle it here. Right. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is something we're, that's what we're about. That's what the Gideons are about. Right. Amen? So let's look at some scriptures here. Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Isn't it great that we all believe? Yes. Amen. But think about all those that don't believe. We work with them. Yeah, we Amen? You shop with them. You see, you see them in the store. They're everywhere. They're like the, it's like, uh, you know, the movie. I see lost people everywhere. Yes. Dead people is right. So now here in, in, in Romans chapter 3, and we'll read verses 19 and 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the purpose of the law. That's the purpose of any law. Amen? Whether it's the law of Moses or it's the law of the land. Right. Law shows you what the boundaries are. Right. And going beyond the boundaries is breaking the law or sin. Mm -hmm. So the problem with the law of God is not, it's not the law itself. Because the law is holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good, according to Romans 7, 12. The problem lies with the weakness of human flesh. Look at uh, Romans 8 and 3 here, if you would, Sheila. The problem is not with the law because the law is holy. The law is righteous. The law is, is good. The problem is flesh. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The law couldn't work because it only had, the only way it could work is through us. Right. Flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. <laughs> this is part of the good news, okay? Because the law couldn't do what it was meant to do because of the weak flesh. Uh -huh. So God sends his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Right? So, because of the reality of sin that's in us, the law ends up arousing sinful desires so that we commit sin. You say, well, that don't seem right. But that's exactly what it's for. Yeah. Amen? Look at Romans chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment of the law, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Praise the Lord. So comes the new commandment, the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. I'm going quick here, and so just stay with me because I'm trying to abbreviate this to the point where you know, I'm not keeping you here past your lunchtime because some of you look a little weak. Hey, I'm <laughs> I don't want you passing out on me. <laughs> for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Right. For finding fault with them. Now, remember, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is good. The law is holy. The law is righteous. The problem with the law is it had to work through us. So the fault that was found, we just read. But if that first covenant had been faultless, then there would be no place have been sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the day comes, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. If you could skip to verse 13 now, Sheila. In that, he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. 
Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now, the main distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is that the Old was primarily involved with external performance by people, amen, under that law, which we just read a moment ago was the problem. Because of our weakness, our flesh, we weren't able to perform what the law demanded. Right? Right? So now the New Testament, or the New Covenant, I should say, is grounded in people's inner transformation in Christ by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Now, it, it might sound simplistic, but it's profoundly true. Life in the New Covenant is Jesus. Yes. Yes. He's the out. Look at the. Uh, I, I want to have you turn to these for the sake of time. I'll just tell you, and you if you want to write them down and go back and validate or verify that I'm not making this up. <laughs> He's the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation 1.8. He's the first and the last, verse 17 of Revelation 1. He's the mediator of a better covenant, Hebrews 8 and 6. Jesus lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25. He's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Hebrews 7.25 as well. Jesus offered himself for sins once for all time. Hebrews 10.12. He sacrificed, or excuse me, he sanctified us to God through the offering of his body. Sanctified us, set us apart to God, amen, through the sacrifice of his body. Amen. Hebrews 10.10. Jesus opened up a new and living way into the presence of God so that we have confidence to enter the most holy place through his blood. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. Instead of hiding in the bushes, amen, in the garden filled with guilt and shame, we can draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. Yes. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. God has accepted us as we are in Christ. Instead of having to wait once a year for the high priest to enter the Holy of Holies, according to Hebrews 9 and 7. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at this, Sheila, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we don't have to wait for the high priest to come once a year to enter into the Holy of Holies because we are the Holy of Holies in Christ. And we have been sprinkled by the blood. Amen. Look at James chapter 1, verse 25. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed, right? Yes. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein. This would have been a good scripture for the Galatians. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Having begun in the Spirit, now you're going to try to perfect yourself under the law, which has been mm -hmm. superseded by a better covenant. He being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So freedom was never meant to be hoarded. It should be heralded. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. Amen? Acts 1 and 8, the scripture that, that uh, Bruce just quoted from here a couple of moments ago. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Praise the Lord. So here's the, here's the connection here that I'm trying to get to. Living in the understanding of the new covenant, 
and keeping the new commandment. Right? The new commandment of love. Love one another. Love your neighbor. Praise the Lord. So when you, when you understand the new covenant and you keep the new commandment, it opens the doors for us to fulfill the new commission. If you believe the gospel, the good news of Jesus, amen, the, 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 the new covenant, and you believe and enter in to the new commandment, to love as I have loved you, love others. It opens the door then for you to do the new commission, the great commission, which is what he's speaking of here, to take this truth to everybody, yes. to anybody, yes. to somebody. Because the doors of heaven have swung wide open to everybody. Yes. It's a free gift. Mark, Mike was singing about it here this morning. The four living creatures, the 24 elders, falling down before the Lamb, and what did they sing? They sang a new song about this new commission. Uh -huh. It wasn't just any old new song. It was a new song about the new commission. Right. Uh -huh. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sung a new song. What was the song? Well, they sung the song and sang, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Praise the Lord. Amen. Native American, African American, Hispanic, Slavic, Asian, Caucasian, rich, poor, male, female, old, young, single, divorced, Married, widowed, orphaned, unemployed, on welfare, in prison, amen, homeless, alcoholic, drug addict, homosexual, abused, abuser, and legalist, amen. Jesus loves them all. Yes. And everybody needs to hear his gospel. Yes. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. And you want to see all that we claim the promises then start sharing them with somebody else. Yes. Because it's like a river. It has to flow. Yes. And if, it, if it's not flowing through you, you're not getting any benefit of it. Right. Praise the Lord. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, and old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ. All right, verse 21. No, I'm sorry. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. This is what people need to hear. Yeah. Not how horrible they are, not what wretches they are, not what despicable, useless, worthless, whatever. They need to know that God has made it possible for them to be reconciled and to come out of whatever it is they're in and into Christ. Into a greater reality. Yes. Amen. Now, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Yes. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Yes. Praise the Lord. There are billions. We've heard it spoken of already this morning. Billions today are outside of the kingdom of God with no hope apart from Jesus. I don't care how high you elevate their educational system, how much you do with their culture, how much you do with their economics. They're still lost and undone without God. Open the paper. We've got millionaires that are still blowing their brains out and dying of drug overdoses and committing suicide and everything else. It has nothing to do with how much money they've got. Educated people go nuts. Yes. They do crazy stuff. Because they're empty. Yes. And they're always looking for an answer that can only come from one place. Yes. From God. And the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. This has got nothing to do with denominations. It's a unity of diversity. 
I, I've been to three funerals in less than a month in three different churches. One was a Lutheran church. One was a, a federated church, which is like Baptist, so more or less. Well, I shouldn't say that because they'd probably argue about that. But, okay, one of them was a Lutheran. One of them was a federated. One of them was a reformed church. And I heard Jesus preached in all three of them. Now, I might have found some theological things that I could have disagreed with, but I wasn't interested in debating theology. I was there to hear something of hope. Yes. And that's Jesus. Hallelujah. All born again believers in Christ. And if you believe in Christ, you are in Christ. So every born-again believer, whether they're Pentecostal, whether they're Reformed, whether they're dispensational, whether they're Orthodox, whether they're fundamentalist, whether they're socially active, whether they're charismatic, Catholic, evangelical, mainline, liturgical, and so on, they're already in Him if they're believers in Him. We're not called to create unity. But according to Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 3, if you put that up there, Sheila. We are to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Yes. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Yes. Amen? Amen? The world has never seen what could happen if the body of Christ laid aside all of our hostility, sure. all of our bitterness, sure. all of our resentment, all of our suspicion, our mistrust our competitive spiritedness for the sake of the gospel. Mm -hmm. But Jesus told us what would happen in John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Yes. We could take a huge step closer to fulfilling the new commission if we decided today to follow the new commandment mm -hmm. under the new covenant. Most of us came from background, different backgrounds, and I came out of a very a holiness Pentecostal church. God bless them. I got good friends still there. But there is a lot of division, even within denominations. We spend as much time fighting against the church down the street as we do trying to reach the people across the street that are unchurched. And is it any wonder then? that the non-believer is put off sure. by the attitudes of the church. Right. Because we've failed to understand the reality of the new covenant, it's hard for us to put into practice the new commandment. And without the new commandment, there's no new commission. Right. If you can't love, somebody that you doesn't look like you, doesn't believe exactly like you, doesn't see like you see, think like you think, then it's going to be very difficult to reach them. Right. Right. Let me read something to you from an old hymn. We rarely sing out of the hymnals anymore. and That's all good. That's just what we do. But I don't even know the name of this hymn. I just found some of the words to it, but Here's what it says, and I think it's very appropriate. When I'm dying, how glad I shall be that the lamp of my life has blazed out for thee. I shall not mind in whatever I gave, labor or money, some sinner to save. I shall not mind that the way has been rough, but that thy dear feet led the way was enough. Praise the Lord. 
Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It's great that God has given us all that we've talked about here this morning. But think about it. If you had a million dollars, and we just put it in dollar terms because after all this is America, <laughs> and you had the most beautiful mansion, you know, 40 rooms, 20,000 feet, whatever, swimming pool, uh, stables, you know, Mercedes Benz and whatever, all the uh, Rolls Royces and all that. But it was on some secluded place where it was only you. You would soon lose interest in all of that. Why? Because nobody else gets to see it. It's just you wallowing in your extravagance. And I think it's that way with the gospel. When we hoard it to ourselves, when we're not willing to reveal what it is, what these great things are that God has done for us, it loses its significance. We become so self-centered, so self-indulgent, that we forget that the, the least little things that we take for granted, there are people out there that have never experienced it don't even know that, that there's a possibility that they could experience it. And so we, not only are we not allowing others to experience what we experience, but we're not enjoying the experience we have. Because the only way you can enjoy it is to give it away, is to share it with somebody else. The more you talk about it, you ever, ever notice, the more you talk about things, the more real they become, the more immediate and, and, and valid and, and important they are. Same way with the gospel. The more you share it, the more you talk about it, the more you express it, not only does it become real to somebody else, but it becomes more real to you. It becomes a greater reality in your life. Amen? Amen. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Amen. That's what this is all about. Praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 22, this will be the last scripture. Revelation 22, verses 20 and 21. And we'll wrap up with this. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Everybody's saying, Come, Lord Jesus. And we keep talking about the return of the Lord. But he said himself, he wasn't coming until this great revival takes place here on earth. Amen. That's up to us. Yep. He has made us ambassadors. Yep. So until we start sharing this good gospel of grace, this good news of the new covenant, by using the new commission in the light of the new commandment. Nothing's changing. Amen. We're leaving it up to the Gideons. We're leaving it up to some evangelist in Africa or someplace else when it's our responsibility. Yes, thank God for the Gideons. Thank God for, for missionaries. Thank God for people that are willing to make those sacrifices. But what about us? We're ambassadors. Those signs that he talked about, they follow them that believe. Not just the Gideons. It wasn't just for the Gideons to go into all the world. Thank God they are, or the world wouldn't be getting met. The, 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 the commission would not be being fulfilled. But it's our responsibility. Who's my neighbor? Right? The one that you run into. The one you come into contact with. The one you work with. The one you shop with. With the, the, the one at the garage where you get your car fixed, the one at the dry cleaners where you pick up your laundry. Yeah. And maybe even, just maybe, the one that lives next door with the barking dog <laughs> and the eight cars in the front yard. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I, I remember. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Right? 
Jesus said on that great day of the feast, he said, anybody that's thirsty, come and drink. Another place he said, and this is what the Holy Spirit will come, and he said, it's like a river. And out of your belly, if you drink, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Yeah. And Ezekiel said it like this, and everywhere the water flows, there will be life. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's a promise. That's a promise here. Amen. Take that word, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is in you because of your born-again experience, and the water flows. Mm -hmm. And everywhere the water goes, life is a result. Everywhere the Holy Spirit touches, the result is always life. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, his word has come to give us life, and that more abundantly. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Amen. Lord. Give him one more hand clap today. Thank you. <laughs> praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So I'm just challenging you. As much as you want your house to be saved, think about the house next door, too. Amen. Amen. Yeah. In all of your getting, get somebody saved. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thank you again, uh, Bruce and, and, the, and the Gideons and all the great work that you're doing. Appreciate you being here so much this morning. Thank all of you for giving and for sharing your day with us. God bless you. You're dismissed in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Have a great day in the Lord. Hallelujah.